Welcome to STEMiverse Podcast Episode 56. In this episode, Peter talks with Gil Bosnanski. Gil is all about engaging people with technology. As an international leader in the maker community, inspiring speaker and teacher, Gil has spent the last eight years building a proven track record in developing STEM and maker environments and is excited by the challenge of harnessing technology in new and innovative ways. Gil is always looking for the personal narrative in every project and shares it with as many people as possible. Gil is currently the Creative Technologies Lead at the Department of Education in New South Wales, helping shape STEAM within the public education sector. In the past, he worked with the City of Melbourne, running the Makerspace at the Library at the Dock in Docklands, as well as developed and deployed the Creative Technologies Hub for Hobson's Bay City Council. In our discussion, we drill into Gil's previous life in the movie industry in Los Angeles and how his learnings and experiences led to his reinvention as the kosher Tony Stark. We talk about his experiments with cutting-edge technology, prototyping, how he's using social media and YouTube to expand his reach, and much more. This is Stemiverse Podcast Episode 56. Stemiverse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for life in a world of radical change and why not abundance. And here we are, another episode of Stemiverse. It's actually been a, a long time since my last one. And um, it's now November the 30th. And I've got Gil Posnanski with me, also known as the Koshas Tony Stark. Hi, Gil. How are you today? Hey, Peter. How are you doing? Oh, good. Thanks. Whereabouts are you? I'm actually in Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne. Melbourne, Victoria right now. Just uh, flew in from Sydney yesterday no, and uh, just uh, I fl- uh, fly around a little bit, but uh, I got caught up in the rains in Sydney yes. and I'm just enjoying the Melbourne, uh, the summer right now. So it's actually a beautiful day. Yeah. So you were in my neighborhood that we did have a, a few days of really intense uh, rain and uh, actually today is nice and sunny. Uh, finally, we're starting to dry. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah, I thought I was. Uh, it was a little bit like a Melbourne day. It started beautiful, and then suddenly it was torrential, and uh, I was like, "Wow, I should have brought my swimming gear for a whole another reason." <laughs> At least an umbrella would help. It was definitely interesting. Yeah. So you are a maker. You're a teacher. You're a, a keynote speaker as well. It's very intriguing, and uh, I found a lot of very interesting bits and pieces in your online profiles. So, would you like to take a few minutes and Thank tell you. us a little bit about you? Tell us about your background, and then we'll start picking through it. Sure. Um, so my background is a little bit different from some of the other things, that, other makers and other kind of teachers that I've met. As a young lad, I was absolutely smitten by story and by media, especially films. Uh, my father took me to see a film when I was three years old, and that was it. I, As a three-year-old, I wanted to actually be what I, in part of what I was actually seeing. And as I grew older, I actually understood that there was a process. It was a job. I ended up exploring that in high school, went to university, got a Bachelor of Media Arts, then went on, did an honors year, did a master's, and actually really had the honor to go to UCLA and actually uh, wow. spend a year there in the film and television department, which was amazing. It was a dream come true. And uh, I spent nine years uh, in the industry over there, uh, working for a number of companies and meeting the people who inspired me from a young age. And it was absolutely fantastic. And then returned home to Australia and forgot that there is very little film work and industry work here. As much as I would love to have been able to keep going, I realized I was not going to be able to keep doing what I had been doing in in the U.S., just because of the industry. So I started exploring the possibility of using the same things that captured my interests in the film industry. Mm. And to me, that was actually kind of creating and making. You know, 
I'm trying to do this really quickly, but I, I, I became known as uh, having a reputation when I was in the industry of being the guy that if you gave something to that was you didn't know the answer to, you just let him go and he'll come up with some sort of creative right. answer. And what I didn't realize then was I was actually kind of self-training myself in the maker field before that label was ever used. So while I was formally trained as a cinematographer, I'd be the guy who would stand behind someone using a lathe and then 20 minutes later use it as if I've, uh, you know... <laughs> With very little training, but understand the, that that process, yeah. So I kind of thrived on that. I became a bit of a sponge in in that area. I, my best friends on set were usually the set builders and the prop makers because they were introducing me to all these amazing processes like um, casting, molding. The first ever three D printer I saw was actually on set in the uh, prop makers uh, workshop, which had been made literally. It was I think like a rep rep before it was actually oh, named yeah. that. Uh, it was all parts coming straight out of uh, Home Depot. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of blown away and, and wanted to be able to explore that myself. So, uh, you know, there's no fun being Captain Kirk. <laughs> when, when is that? So, um, that would have been uh, 1990, right, 1990s, wow. early days. I would say. Very, very early make a days. Movement. Yeah. Very early days. Surprised it was a 3D printer then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to even put together. Right. It was not even called a 3D printer. It was yeah. called a rapid prototyper. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what it was. And the way I looked at it, you know, everyone wants to be Captain Kirk or Luke Skywalker. Mm. So, it's, you've got to have the, the things in your hands. You know, you're not Captain Kirk going onto a planet. I was actually Scotty. Uh, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to be Scotty. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. But Scotty didn't get the girls, you know. It's like, that's the I, whole I point. I the cool machines were we geeks. <laughs> Absolutely. And I totally get what you're saying. Actually, I actually think that girls uh, do get attracted. Uh, sorry, we <laughs> a bit sidetracked now, but uh, we're, we're getting sidetracked, but isn't it a wonderful time now that we've got things like the Big Bang Theory and all the rest of it? I know that when I was growing up, uh, yeah. you, you didn't yeah, start conversations with with uh, the opposite sex showing them, uh, you know, technology or anything like Look that. And now, printer. yeah, they're, they're, it, it's actually, it's it's something that's, you know, it's kind of like the revenge of the nerds in, 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 a, in a way, in the sense that, you know, having intellect and understanding and exploring is now become a, a really interesting thing that uh, that can engage, which is yeah. it's, fantastic. It's a golden age, isn't it, for geeks? Like for people that want to oh, yeah. learn and do things, it's uh, it's never been better. It's pretty amazing. We live in an incredible time. I mean, just from the 90s to now, what what I've got in my garage and my workshop is just mind-blowing. Yes. Well, we, we, we'll get to that. I just wanted to ask you now, all that- Absolutely. So, in the 1990s, right? Yep. Is all that happening in Melbourne or are you still in the US? So, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in Hollywood right. at that point. And again, that uh, that industry is kind of a little different from anything else I've ever experienced mm. because when a film production's on and going, you're burning hundreds of thousands of dollars every day. <laughs> so, if you had a an answer that cost, you know, 50 grand to get a machine in to try and answer it, they just would be like, why are you asking? Just go and do it because it's it, it's not a, an outlay because they're losing. Right. So, this technology then, like the, the applicator technology, 3D printing, and I guess a lot other, uh, much more than that, was used by the film industry as a tool to get things done, right? Really quickly with minimal waste. I think that, you know, I definitely used it for that way. And the people that I had uh, relationships with and worked for allowed me to go out and kind of look at manufacturing techniques to answer questions mm -hmm. that we needed on set. Mm -hmm. The 3D printer was literally, uh, I know it's standard practice now to prototype, uh, let's say, props and then give them to the director instead of photos so that they could get it. A, 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 you know, it checked off a lot quicker, which is kind of interesting. Back then, they were exploring that technology. Yep. So, um, the printer that I saw was actually a hobby machine that someone had put together. And it was really rough in the sense of the result they were getting. But they were already looking at ways of being able to utilize it to fix and fasten up workflows. Yeah. So, and that was what really interested me about that. So, are those experiences uh, now, like looking back, do you consider those experiences like pivoting in your career? Did it change something in you? And you, you, I guess when you came back to Australia, and we'll, we'll get to that, and when and why did you do that? Uh, were, were all these experiences influential to get you to do eventually what you're doing now? Um, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. But at the time, I considered myself just to be, you know, it was kind of like Gil's Playground. Hmm. So, uh, if, you know, I was forever looking at new products, uh, materials, equipment, and kind of justifying it uh, by 
applying them to you know production questions or answers. Example of that was I needed an adapter for a, a lens for a camera that didn't uh, and it didn't exist. So you know to be able to go and like use the lay that I was talking about before and create that on site and be able to modify it as you as you need and and, and kind of run with it was what I loved doing. And I realized as much as as storytelling was a big emphasis of that. I got excited when, you know, you could put something that didn't exist in the palm of your hand or give it to someone. Yeah. And without actually explaining to them, you were communicating. And that was a bit of a shift for me uh, yeah. when, when I realized that. And that actually happened a big time for me in Melbourne. So, it's, you know, in a way, it's like showing somebody something is a lot more effective than talking about it. Like theoretically talking and waving your hands around, let me show you, now I, now I get it. So it's much quicker, right, to Absolutely. get the results you want. Yeah. Absolutely. I have people who come up to me all the time and they tell me their great ideas and they think that just communicating them verbally is the work. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, I used to say to people all the time, don't tell me about it, show me. Show me. Yeah. Go build it, you know, go do it. And it actually got to the point where I've got stickers that I hand out that says, don't tell me, show me. And it's a hashtag I use on Instagram. <laughs> show me. It's a power of prototyping. It's like nothing beats it. You can spend two hours trying to explain an idea or you can show it. And, and, you know, that's that whole idea of a picture is a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And as creatures, we are visual creatures. And I boil this all down to communication. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do is ultimately communicating an idea, a thought, an expression to someone else. And there isn't a maker that I haven't uh, met or, or, or introduced that, you know, the questions that I ask in some interviews that I run on, on YouTube are all about understanding what that uh, that communication is all about. What is it that you want to express? Because once I understand that, then I totally understand the core base of why that person's a maker. Mm. Hmm. That's very interesting because it does bring us into the maker space now. And I'm not talking about the, the physical space, but the way of thinking like a maker where you've got an idea and then the next thing you should do is to get some, I don't know, some wood and prototype it, a 3D printer, some breadboard and some wires and put it together. How do you learn that? Ah, that's the really interesting part, isn't it? Does it come naturally? Do you learn it at school? Uh, should you be learning prototyping at school? What's your take? So let me just clarify. Are you asking me how I learned or how people learn out I guess out there? both. So uh, like I'm thinking that going forwards, like we know that ideas are, ever, are not actually ideas is where things begin. Like our new industries, the whole industries begin with a simple idea, but they're not really valuable unless you can at least build the prototype. But I, I remember in my days at school, prototyping was not a important thing like our task back then was uh come an idea and write about it and that's it basically that's where you stop you're at a, a composition about sure. your idea but the skill of creating prototypes whether in a 3d drawing package whether you use uh, i know clay to put it together or wood uh, some kind of physical material or a computer program to draw it is something that is valuable to develop isn't it well, it is. It depends on where you're coming from. I mean, uh, what you've just uh, laid out there is is very much an industry based pathway. So, um, you know, it's the idea of creating something and be able to take it to market and and, and having a, a monetary value and using maker skills to be able to uh, express that. Uh, recently, I went and heard a, a talk uh, by some programmers uh, or coders. I shouldn't say programmers. Mm -hmm. That's two eight nineteen eighties coders. Everyone's coding uh, and. Uh, it was kind of interesting because someone asked the question, like, how do you how do you uh, protect your IP or your ideas? And they kind of laughed at them and said that IP has no value and that if you want me to sign a non-disclosure, I'm not even going to talk to you because our whole thing is just being able to pump that out. Yeah. And at that point, they lost me because really, you know, that's an industry thing about trying to throw as many darts in to see what will stick. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem with that is, and I think this is a problem within Australia as a whole when it comes to the coding side of things, is a lot of people will go off and will work in an, in an overseas industry where they will have some protection or at least mm. some acknowledgement to what you're bringing to the table. But if the idea is just to squeeze out ideas and prototype them to, to see what we can put into Bunnings or what we can put into the app store, you know, as the creative person, there's no value to it. There's a financial value, which as, an, uh, as someone who creates the idea may never see. But if that's not acknowledged and seen, again, coming back to that idea of communication, what are you doing? Are you just squeezing out as much potential and, and 
honoring it or are you just squeezing it out for uh, prototyping? So mm-hmm. I know that wasn't really the question you were asking, but I think it's a really important one because what maker culture and the maker community can actually do is empower people to follow those intense projects and allow them to develop them to a point where they can either have a choice to go into market or just create them for the value that they are. Hmm. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Uh, again, going back to to the idea of, of being a species that communicates. I mean, we're yeah. very unique in that sense. Yeah, that actually that was uh, the the context of my question, but I was thinking of uh, just one more element that goes with it, and that is exploration. So. Mm-hmm. You know, humans are born explorers in a way. That's uh, that's how we've survived essentially in in the wild and built a civilization. But in, in modern days, I find that we tend to be explorers of ideas in quite a large extent, and prototyping, you know, and fiddling around with an idea once it becomes reality and we can hold it or we can manipulate it in perhaps three D digital space or physical space. That allows us to improve on our ideas to actually understand our ideas better and you now it happens to me so so often where i come up with an idea i try to explain it say to michelle my wife and she doesn't quite get it but then when i draw it i sit down and try to flesh it out a little bit it becomes a lot more concrete and actually answer a lot of the uncertainties that i had earlier or the the rough points or the, like, the gray areas so that exploration using my hands on a prototyping board or a uh, 3D program mm-hmm. or even just drawing a, um, a flow chart of an idea, I think that engagement with an idea, bring it out of my brain and into the world, that helps. Is that your experience as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I kind of forego the, uh, the laying it out unless it's really complicated. Hmm. I'm kind of a very instinctual maker in that sense, or I will bring people in who are experts in areas that I'm not. But uh, so it, you have to explain uh, actually what, uh, you know, what you want to create. But I, I, I find that um, you've got to have a couple of uh, things in place. One is, you know, it sounds like what you were doing with, you, with your wife, explaining it and, and, and whether it's on a prototyping board or on paper, is you're actually working out the workflow. Mm-hmm. And this is something that's really kind of interesting because this is language that's really, again, in the industry that we're pulling out and putting in a different context. So if I sit down with teachers and I start talking about workflow within the classroom, I get glazed over looks. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like workflow. What, what, are you, what are you talking about? You know, if I use the word pedagogy, they all like, oh, I know that word, but I want to stay away from it too. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because while this conversation we're having is relatively new, what we've been doing, you know, a, a, as a society is we've been prototyping and developing and working out workflows since the time we created the wheel hmm. or we created Flint tools. We, we were exploring with that sort of stuff. We've now just put it into a big label. And now we've got like the labels of making and labels of prototyping. And, and I actually challenge people to say, get rid of the labels. Hmm. Just go and do things the way you naturally feel and, and evolve because there are multiple ways to get to a result. One way is not always the best. Yeah. Like what fits on one person may not fit on another. And I think that's really relative to the education system, especially. Um, you have a lot of students going through primary and secondary school, but that that system may not always hone their talents in the best possible way. Yet by, you know, year 11 and 12, you have uh, students who are, you know, 16, 17, 18, almost having nervous breakdowns because <laughs> if the marks aren't there, their lives are over. Yeah. And I'm like, I look at them and I go, you, ha- you have no idea. <laughs> like, you know, um, what I do if they were going to tell me I was going to do this at, at, at school, I, you know, I stuck my head in comic books and was, was watching videos on, you know, and films and all the rest of it. And it opened up so many different doors. So it, it's not really, you know, one set. It's about having that yearning desire to create something. And in my classes, people will finish a session and they'll go, great, what do I build now? Hmm. And it's like, okay, guys, hang on. You got to think out of it, yeah. out of the box here. Build the thing that at three o'clock in the morning, you've got to go to work at nine, but you still want to finish that one little piece because it's so important to you. Engaging. And those are the projects that you want to do. Yeah. It not, it's not just engaging, but there's a drive and a mm-hmm. desire. Mm-hmm. There's a, I need to finish this because this means something. 
Hmm. Even if it just means something to me. As a filmmaker, especially at film school, I would see a lot of people making these short films. And when I started, we were shooting on 16 mil. So it wasn't, it wasn't what it was today where I could take an iPhone or a digital camera, shoot for hours and it doesn't cost anything. 16 mil, I think I did the math back in the early 90s, uh, sorry, and probably you know 80s, and we were talking about three minutes of film before it was processed was a thousand dollars. So you had to you had to have that money there, and then to process it was another you know thousand, and then to get it across to a to some tape so you could edit it in the suite was so you know every second was precious, right? So when you're on there, you were on like you know you had one take or two takes at the tops. If the guy couldn't nail it, you you didn't have the ability to keep honing what it was. you know, and that idea that that cost came out of your pocket as a student also meant that you had to get everything ready and you had yeah. to you had to be there. But you did it because you had a desire to create something. And at the end of the end of it, you know, we'd all go make our films, and I'd be like, "Cool, where can I go now and show my film?" And everyone else would be like. Uh, we're going to put it away because the next film will be better. And I was always yeah. like, listen, you're going to go share that with everyone. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but it doesn't work or people don't like it. I'm like, you will find your audience. <laughs> and I believe as a maker and a, a, as a teacher, it's the same thing. You may not, you might not uh, engage everyone, but when you go down to a maker fair and you do show what you've been creating, and we actually did this in in the city of Melbourne, we created a thing called Mini Make Day at Library at the Dock in Melbourne, and we would invite maker groups to come in and show what they were doing to the wider public. And at the end of the very first one, I knew most of the people who came down and they were saying, you know, people were blown away by what we were doing. And I said, yeah, because you've got to go out there and show them. Yeah. People don't know what they don't know. And when they don't know what's possible, they won't get engaged. So, uh, so I guess I'm telling this whole story to, to say, you really want to be able to create something that you want to share. Don't build mm-hmm. something and then put it into a, a cupboard, whether it's a film, whether it's a story, whether it's, you know, we've got to stop thinking about talents just being, you know, running, jumping, dancing, writing, yeah, yeah. you know, playing an instrument. It's everything that you do with a passion has a, a relevance to it. And I'm really harping on this idea because at the baseline, every single person on this planet, I believe, is hardwired to create mm-hmm. and to communicate. That's who we are. And making it is a very powerful way of being able to to uh, have that come across. Yeah. So it's it's like very interesting as you are putting it. The cost of experimentation back in the eighties and the nineties, and then the opportunities to share your work with others versus the same things today. Like the cost of experimentation today is close to zero. And so is the, the cost of sharing with others, like YouTube. <laughs> it just take oh my your gosh. video yeah. at zero cost, upload it to YouTube for zero cost to reach millions and millions of people potentially, right? Uh, <laughs> within a few seconds of the upload. The, the the flip side of that is also, I think, maker culture and the maker community, the global movement is powerful and is growing now because of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can go in, you can make a project, you can share it with people. You know, there are people all around the world. Jimmy Durista, and, um, you know, is a great example. Uh, you know, the Make Magazine calls him, mm-hmm. you know, the maker's maker. Yes. You know, over a million people on YouTube. You know, literally, uh, I had the experience of writing him a letter and then turning up on his doorstep in New York and spending a week with him. And, and, and you know, we... We ended up becoming kind of really close in that time. And I remember the, the first time I met him, I said, listen, this is I don't want to freak you out, but I've been watching your videos for so long. It's like I know you, so I'm going to relate to you like we've known each other. And he was cool about it. And, you know, it even got to a point where he was in his workshop and he needed something. And I reached back and grabbed it. And he looked at me and I, I said, I, I knew you put it there because of your videos. And he was just like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, so, so even though – you're able to share your experiences and they're not kind of compartmentalized anymore. You can actually go and put them out there. And I think that's what's really, really important. And I think that's also the base of kind of make a culture. Just because I know something doesn't mean that you don't know something. Hmm. Or if I know something, why can't you learn it? Why can't I share it with you? Why can't I be a, a link in the chain that gets you to the end of your result? Yeah. And, and that is incredibly, incredibly empowering. And that's why I kind of took that step away from the film industry and and kind of went, you know what, this is kind of what I want to do. (laughs) Well, um, glad you brought this up because actually it's one of the things that I want to ask you, Uh, but I'm going to reserve this question for very, very shortly, just a few minutes from now. I want to uh, continue with your story that started in Los Angeles and now bring you to Australia. At some point you come back, right? And you start a new life here. Yep. 
Can you tell us a bit about that? When did it happen? Perhaps why, if you want to talk about that? And more important, what happened after you got here, back to Australia? Okay, so I mean, without going into it too too much, because yep. we, we've only got an hour here, and I lo- I love to tell my <laughs> stories. So, um, short version is that um, yeah. So uh, a number of people that I that I worked with um, basically became very successful, and through them I got to see what the other side of the brass ring was all about, and just I realized that uh, what I was aiming for, I, I just wouldn't achieve it, and in fact, um, I realized that because of my love of storytelling and cinema and, and everything else, if I actually crossed that line, I would have put it right in my back and uh, mm. I wouldn't have walked back. Yeah. So I, I just kind of realized what was going on for me and I just said, you know what, there's a little bit more to the world and I kind of want to make sure that I'm making the right choice. And just to give you in context, I'd been working towards this goal since probably about the age of 12 Mm -hmm. when I first picked up a video camera. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can imagine my family and and my friends and everyone who'd know me were like, what's going on here, man? You sacrificed all this stuff. You know, you, 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 you moved the world in a, in a way and got to do everything. And I decided I'd come back to Australia. My sister had just had her first child and I didn't want to be that uncle that, Mm -hmm. you know, you only meet, once every 10 years and, you know, it's, go give Uncle Gil a kiss and the kid's like, Who's that? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and, you, know, you know, you see it and it's like, you know, the kid will give the family member a kiss but he's like, oh my God, I've, you know, this, I'm now going to go into therapy. <laughs> um, so, I didn't want any of that to happen and I used that as an excuse to come back home and after a year of, of kind of speaking to film production companies here, um, someone made the comment of, well, you can do it over there but you can't do it here. And I kind of went, oh, you know, it was just so frustrating. Personally, I really believe there just wasn't enough work to go around. And that was a good way of deflecting it. But I took it to heart and through some contacts decided that I would I would make a short film that was kind of at the level of a Hollywood type production. And um, this was, it was, a, oh my gosh, it was a few years ago, but it was about 12 months before the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who, hmm. which is the British TV hmm. series that uh, yeah. we all kind of grew up with here in Australia. Yeah. And I had just, um, just before I left uh, to come back, I was living in like a co-op house. So, I had roommates that drove me crazy <laughs> and I wanted to exercise those demons. So, what I actually did was I created a short, uh, like seven minute YouTube video, or that was the plan. It was supposed to go on YouTube called My Roommate is a Dalek. <laughs> and the idea was that uh, it was kind of like, think uh, The Odd Couple, uh, Felix and Oscar, but instead it was Gil and a Dalek called Orange Blend. And kind of reached out to some people who saw what I was doing and uh, they happened to work for the BBC. And they said, are you serious about this project? And I said, yes. And they said, we'd love to be able to put that as part of the kind of celebration. And I realized I committed myself to building a full-size operational Dalek that had to exist outside of a a studio in the real world and I went about and spent 10 months kind of going to the garage and for the very first time without any support creating a big project from the ground up and um, that was amazing in in a lot of ways. It was also very emotional because coming back to Australia, my my best friend at the time had no idea what I was doing and didn't understand it and actually enrolled a lot of people to to say, you know, Gil, you're doing the wrong thing. Go get a job at 7-Eleven. Yep. Don't, don't be doing this. We don't understand what's going on. Um, <laughs> thankfully, we, our friendship survived that. Uh, when he first saw him finished, it was it – was, you know, he got so, it. So, he demonstrated. Um, thank goodness. Essentially, let me show you <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, well, basically, when you know he walked in the room and took one look and saw this, uh, like you know, full scale Dalek walking down the street and, and and conversing and and interacting, and I was using again like a Duino and remote control stuff mm-hmm. and uh, you know very early Raspberry Pi, and we shot the video and part of shooting that video was actually um, shooting some footage in the city in Melbourne, and uh, I took him out to one of a convention just to do a shakedown. And some people said to me, um, you know, where did you build him? And I said, oh, my garage. And they said, oh, do you know these guys who build these things? I said, no. And and this guy I was having conversations said to me, he goes, I'm the president of a makerspace. Would you like to come down and talk about your project? And I said, sure. You know, and so I brought him down, spoke to them. And uh, started looking around and said, what, what, what's this place? You know, what's this all about? You've got some interesting stuff. And they said, well, we've got a makerspace, you know. And it's a thank you. Why didn't you just come down, you know, come down for a month and come hang out with us? My favorite quote out of that story is that about 
three years later, that same guy who's the president, Dave Chatter, came up to me and said, Gil, you came once and never left. Hmm. And that's exactly what happened. I, I realized that I found a space where I didn't have to work alone. And, uh, you know, there's some really funny stories that come out of it. The Makerspace is the community connected hack space in Hawthorne in Melbourne. And uh, one of my good friends now, uh, you know, he used to say to me when I bring a project, he goes, can you stop bringing the project, your projects into the Makerspace? This is early on. And I was like really upset. Like I thought maybe I broke a rule or something. And, uh, he, you know, he, he said to me, um, he goes, no, no, the problem is your projects are, are cooler than my projects. So I end up helping <laughs> you on your project. I don't get mine done. And, uh, you know, my immediate answer to that was, no, that's no problem. Let's finish this one and then let me help you on yours and I'll learn something as well. Yep. So, uh, again, that idea of, of, you know, being able to share, I learned a lot about electronics and programming, uh, coding, excuse me. Uh, yes, <laughs> program. correct. Um, uh, yeah, in all of that um, and realized more and more that I wanted to be involved in, in like kind of make a culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I didn't realize at the time was when we were out in the city, People were coming up, obviously, because the spectacle of, of having a, a Dalek walk down the street is phenomenal. Uh, the very first time we took him out where I live, a young lady jumped out of a car to run across against traffic across the street to tell us how wonderful we are. We watched her car roll into traffic because she didn't have her handbrake on. And then that point, I was like, something really, really interesting is going on here. And I haven't seen any engagement like that except for the hysteria of a movie opening. So I was like hang on, instead of spending five years trying to get a movie project up and then another three years in putting it together and then having the opening, if I can generate this in a few months by creating something and taking it out into the public, that's tying into everything that I learned formally about interaction and creativity Mm -hmm. and engagement. So I started realizing the ties between both. And through that, was able to uh, meet some people from the city of Melbourne who were creating a maker space through their library program. And yeah, uh, I originally wow. applied for um, a position, and uh, yeah, that gave me a legitimate way of being able to explore this area and share it with other people. So that's now uh, in the city of Melbourne, right? The maker program is that what you're referring to? Yes, that's the program that runs through the Melbourne Library Services. Right. They have a number of maker spaces. Um, created within the within the uh the library and i was the creative technologist and worked out of the library of the dock for the first four years right. which was uh, really interesting it was the kind of pilot project i'd like to talk about libraries in a minute but first uh, just something that um i actually uh felt like a, a I could have written. <laughs> so I was looking at yeah, on your okay. website um, and you've got your profile there uh, titled The Man Behind the Kosher Tony Stark, which is an amazing title for yourself. Right. I will get to that again, like Thank so you. many things. So uh, I just quote something that you've wrote, written there. I spent years watching from the sidelines while people created amazing things. While I wanted why it seemed so easy for them, but not for me. And, you know, I sympathize. I feel exactly the same very, very often. And, um, you know, this is something that I'd like to ask you, first of all, to tell us a little bit more about that, because I think that is something that a lot of people feel. And then if that is something that guides you to keep learning, to keep understanding, you know, to to start uh, becoming as good in the things that are interesting to you as those other people that you're looking and wondering about how can they be so good. Now, how did you respond to that question? How are you responding to that question? So it's exactly what, what I wrote there. Mm. Um, for a long time, I even, even with some of the things that we spoke about earlier working in the film industry, I was always looking kind of at the sides, not in an in a envious or, or, you know, mm. way, but just seeing what people were doing and just uh, wondering why that was – like, why couldn't I do that or why couldn't I start exploring those areas? And uh, like you were asking before, and that's, uh, you know, the, the idea is how, do, how does someone learn this sort of mm. stuff? Well, traditionally, I mean, you mentioned it, I call myself the co- – or I've been called the, the and therefore Tony adopted Stark, yeah. the kosher Tony Stark. So traditionally, the Jewish communities are not really known for being plumbers and builders mm. and, you know, uh, doctors and lawyers, yes. But, uh, you know, kind of manual no, labor is not, technical, not right? something yeah. – 
well, you know, to a certain degree, I think uh, the industry out of Israel is incredibly technical, and but that's a, that's a mm. completely different area. Oh, high tech. Um, that is high tech, right? Absolutely high tech. Mm. But, uh, you know, my parents, my father didn't work in, the, in a garage, um, uh, although he was a picture framer and he did do kind of, you know, he assembled these things. It was very specific. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a model to understand how to actually go and create stuff. So, I had to go out and, and learn myself either by doing – and that's a very hard thing given the way everyone is brought up in society. We're not allowed to fail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, usually yep. you try something. And I remember for myself getting to a certain point in projects and then stopping because I was scared the next step would, would be a disaster. So, I had all these kind of like unfinished projects for years. A bit of, um, a bit of fear then, like a social absolutely. pressure. I can't fail. Yep. Well, more pressure on myself. Than anything else mm. and because i cared so much it would intensify and i remember um you know being in a workshop that i had in los angeles and like you know probably the only time that i ever questioned my mental health because i would go in there and the negative talk that would come out of my head because i had the pressure of having to find an answer was you know i realized in a very quick time that i had to i had to change how i was doing things and and that taught me a, a really important lesson which was to ask to go and ask people if i didn't know and I like for me personally, I love working in collaboration and, you know, especially when there's no leader, when it all becomes free forming because you've mm. got people that you can turn around and go, hey, I was thinking about doing it this way. And then, you know, someone might go, well, have you thought about this? And again, that leads to the experiences I was having in maker spaces. So that for me relates back to, to why I wrote that on, on my website, because it yeah. really is that frustration of like, I can see it. I want it. I can taste it. I can even touch it but I'm letting myself down because I'm not doing it and I'm not being able to add my unique involvement into that process. And there's a lot of people who feel the same way. So at the end of the day, there's no reason why those things that you are interested in um, are beyond your reach, right? Absolutely. You just have to, to get started, ask the right questions. Uh, I guess people there are very helpful. You can ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask and do it. That, that's what I like to challenge, especially within the education department. I mean, I, as a teacher myself, I have absolute respect for anyone who goes to a classroom. And when you have more than, I think, seven students or five students in a classroom, you can't give that individual attention. And, and, and mm. you know, that becomes that idea of like, if everyone can get it done and they can get it right the first time, then we can move on. And I, I'd love to be able to kind of allow permission to go, you know, the failure is, a, is an achievement as well. And it's such an important part of it. Uh, you know, the big industry is now saying fail faster. Well, you know, I again, I'll challenge even from my own experiences going to in the, a big corporation within Australia and failing and seeing what happens. And mm. fail spectacularly. You know, <laughs> you don't have a job. You know, the idea of fail faster sounds great as long as you're not failing. But I think that's exactly how we that learn. It's a speed important. Like, <laughs> you know, sometimes it takes years to realize that you failed. But I guess the the learning is probably more important than the speed. Absolutely, and uh, you know, to quote one uh, Zig Ziglar, who I really think is inspirational. Yeah. You know, he he once said, "You can." He used the analogy of American football. He goes, "You can make every move on the football field perfectly." You can, you know, zag, you can throw the ball, you can do all that sort of stuff and you can pass off that winning last touchdown and you pass the ball off to some guy who then trips and fumbles and you lose the game. <laughs> and in that moment, it's how you conduct yourself that really is, um, yep. you know, the lesson in that moment. And I think that's true in absolutely everything in life. And we are emotional creatures and making is, is a completely emotional process for me. I'm not going to start a project that I don't want, mm. you know, to succeed in. You know, no filmmaker mm. wants to make a, a bad film. So, sometimes looking at things that don't come out right is actually more pleasurable than seeing the formulaic stuff that, uh, that comes out of the industry right now. So, it's really important to understand that and realize that if that's how you're feeling – the first thing you you know you can do about it is kind of put your hand out. Again, one of the things that I learned out of school and university, or at least this is what was communicated to me, I, and I've spoken to a few other people, but I don't want to talk for everyone, is that uh, a lot of the times when you start a project, you're expected to know every step along the way. So if you have a hundred steps in the project, you need you know a lot of people will not start unless they know every step. And uh, what I, my experience in the in the maker community and, and making these projects is, I usually start with you know step one and two 
and have no idea how step eight is going to work out. But yeah. usually around step six, someone goes, hey, man, that's really cool. Um, hey, have you thought of this? And suddenly step eight has just fallen into place. <laughs> and being kind of, you know, looking at this world, not just in a physical place, but also having a kind of a, a bit of a religious and a, whether you want to call it a universal look or religious look or whatever you want to mm. call it. There's definitely a methodology to being able to put yourself out there and things to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. listen to people's stories, autobiographies of people who are successful, they always say that the success came when they put themselves out there and took a step forward, even yeah. though they didn't yeah. know where it was going to go. Exactly. And it's happened so many times for so many people, so many people in this world that it's not something that you discount. It's actually something that you can sit there and say, well, how can I harness this? And again, the, the whole idea of make a community, whether you're doing something in 3D printing or electronics or learning or something for yourself, to be able to put yourself into those steps, you know, it attracts a lot of the answers you need. I was just thinking as you were talking, like, uh, I'm not sure if I heard that somewhere or we just popped into my mind now, but um, something like this, success comes to those that fail. I could also Absolutely. say they fail a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Elon Musk is, you know, such a great, great example of that. I mean, you know, he succeeded in PayPal and a few other things. I think it was PayPal. I'm not too sure. Yes, I think it was PayPal. PayPal that, that started him off, but he, you know, there are places all around the world right now, these little, you know, industrial hives where people are coding these apps you know, and, and to learn new things to fail. And mm. I believe Warren Buffett won't invest in any entrepreneur who hasn't failed like four times spectacularly. So I guess, um, how could that translate in the traditional school system? Like, do you get extra marks for failing <laughs> a lot in an exam? <laughs> Can you imagine? Let me tell you, um, you do in my class. I mean, I've actually had situations where students have come up and been able to to explain to me what they wanted to do, but got mm. caught up in some of the kind of like the syntax of yeah. putting something together. And I actually give that a lot more credit than this. I had a, actually had a student who was working on something and it fell apart on like the eighth hour. So he copied one of his friends and mm. handed it in. He goes, but that worked. Hmm. I said, but that wasn't, wasn't what you were working on. You know, I yeah. sat him down and, and, you know, we spent some time and went through that. And then I explained to him why the one that he handed in had no value and the one that mm. he failed had yeah, the one so, that doesn't work, that's that's what's valuable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's in that moment is the learning. In that moment is is, is what we're trying to aim for. Uh -huh. Because, you know, it, it's an opportunity uh, to find out the problem in your thinking or in your practice, which is probably in a way perhaps unique to you. You won't find that in a textbook. So unless you experience that failure or that bug, if it's coding or whatever it is, a mechanical problem, so you, you're not going to learn it otherwise. It's not in a textbook. Your teacher won't, won't tell you about it. You know, again, I, I kind of just, I keep challenging people in this uh, podcast, but uh, I don't believe all learning is, is formal learning. Mm. I think, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is what we're geared towards, you know, there weren't any schools for the first couple of hundred thousand years on this planet when we were evolving. Yeah. You know, we were learning by going out there and running, you know, with the animals and working out, oh, you know, if I put this sharp rock on a, on a, on a piece of wood, I've got a spear and now mm. I can actually reach him before he can reach me. Yeah. And you know what? I get to eat. And if I eat, I survive. So, the mammoth. Yeah. A, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, th that didn't come out of a textbook. There wasn't a whole lot of like cavemen mm. or, you know, Neanderthal men who were reading out of a book going, oh, you know what? If we do this, well cool. Like next time we're in a situation like that, we'll do it. Yes. Um, that came out of, you know, I'm sure there, was, there were a lot of people who, who lost their lives trying to explore that possibility. Jump on the mammoth that. and to bring it down. Yeah. It won't work. Absolutely. Okay. Look, Natural selection. There are no birds in submarines and there's no dogs in space unless we shoot them up there, <laughs> um, you know, because they want to go and explore it. Yeah. Yet as one of the unique creatures on this planet, we've changed the face of this planet in mm. so many different ways. You know, <laughs> I... I love dogs, uh, and uh, I remember when I was living at home, I had this dog that used to catch birds in the backyard, and my mother literally said to me, and I love this story, she goes, can you go into the dog and explain to the dog why uh, it's not ethical to kill the birds? And I looked at her and said, are you kidding me? And she goes, no, why? Why can't you explain it? So I brought the dog in, and I said to her, oh, Gemma, I just want to let you know, the birds are allowed to be on the, on the grass too. You shouldn't be killing them. And the dog's turning its head and trying to understand what I'm saying and obviously picking up her name and a few other things. And then the next day, you know, there's a dead bird. And she goes, yep. why didn't the dog understand you? I said, it's beyond the dog. I can't, mm. I can't explain that concept of morality. Yeah. I, can't, 
I can't have a conversation with her about why something's important that way or what it will mean to, you know, to mankind, the planet, the universe. And we, we are so create, you know, like that's, that's what creativity is. We've created a language. We're the only creature on the planet that speaks. We're the only hmm. creature on the, on the, on the planet that communicates at the level we do. Yeah. I mean, dogs do communicate. Usually they say, give me food or get away, you know, <laughs> wolf. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's communication, so, right? And then there's human communication. Like there's a lot of species that can absolutely. exchange information, like a, a bear is coming or a tiger run. Uh, but yeah, it's totally different level. But not, a, not only that, it, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, do I share this or not? And it's something I've been thinking about a lot. So even the way we explain our existence is built on not just communication, but creativity mm -hmm. and this idea. Yeah. Um, I, I, was, I was applying for a PhD, um, which unfortunately was unsuccessful because I'm an art student and a, uh, an a engineering department didn't want to take me on, uh, which oh I thought no. was really funny. But um, the idea was this. Go to the um, MIT. The, uh, yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen <laughs> in the right time. But the idea was, was this. If you look at the Bible as one of the first texts that were ever mass produced and handed out hmm. to the masses, and whether you believe in, in God or don't, it, it's really not relevant. But you understand that that book was a way of people understanding kind of, uh, you know, the analog kind of timeline of mankind. Mm. And if you open up that very first page, it says that there was nothing and then there was a being, whether you want to call it God or a spirit or mm. the universe or whatever else. And he created the universe and created the stars, the sun, the planet, and then on the planet, the water, the land, then the animals, and then man. Mm. And then... This being blew the soul of man into his body through his nose. Mm. <laughs> and that, that soul was a part of this creator, right? And at that point, I, I would argue that every person on the planet has a creative mm -hmm. instinct. Has that. Because the, even the way we explain it is that, you know, we're coming from this, this you know, being mm. that created everything. And created, you know, whether you want to say it created all for us or for whatever, but even the way we explain ourselves, whether it, this was created by by someone writing this book, if it was, then that's how we chose to create it, yeah. to create our, our meaning. And if it wasn't, then, and that's another argument for another podcast, but, you know, if there was a higher deity doing it, then we're tied into it. Yeah. So, I think that, you know, and why don't we honor it? Why do we, why do we say that only if uh, your career you know, turns over thousands of, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, uh, you're a doctor or you're a lawyer, why is that, you know, considered, uh, you know, white collar and then blue collar is the, you know, the plumbers and the painters. I think mm. they're more creative than some of these other people, yeah. uh, you know, hands down. And, you know, uh, I think these days more than ever, if you look at the complexities and the technology involved and the, like the ingenuity that very often is required by those people, you'd know that, you know, that's not that much difference in terms of you know, intensity of thinking to accomplish uh, what prior, prior, like 20, 30 years ago, we think is just very, very basic occupation. Like, I don't know, laying bricks it can lay bricks one on top of the other but you can come up with uh, amazing structures as well based on bricks i'm thinking of lego right now but the same thing applies to plumbing to uh, pretty much anything uh farming look at farming Farming is high tech uh a farmer today is not a farmer a thousand years ago no no way and i mean there's so much technology and so much education involved in that sort of stuff but mm. i remember buying a book that was um it was written just after world war ii and i bought the book because it had basically instructions on how to sharpen um drill bits and mm -hmm. i didn't know that you could actually sharpen a drill bit you know i was like everyone mm. else i go to bunnings buy and buy a new one yeah. when when the drill was done but the book the second chapter of the book it was teaching you how to how to uh, pick the foundations for your house and my friends were like, why would you buy a book like this, whatever? And I said, you know what? When Abed again comes and everything is gone, you're, all, you're, you know, you're an accountant. You know, you're not going to be of need. But if I understand how to do it, you're going to come and speak to me. Yep. You know, it's that simple. Yep. It's like if I understand enough about how to put it together. And we have a whole generation right now who are being brought up with smart devices who, who all they know is if I'm hungry, I hit a button and yeah. food turns up. Yes. Or if I need a car, Google has the know, answer. I, I hit a to, button. I don't know if to, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? You don't have to stress too much. It's just everything is a, a button away. Or a well, it's mad. Yeah. yeah. And it's. And very much it's magic. It's like, mm. you know, we've gone back to like Merlin and all the rest of it. I don't and need the to understand. Thing about where how it we works. Are 
Right. But, you know, if you do want to understand how it worked, it used to be that you'd go in and you'd become Merlin's apprentice and you'd clean up the place. And then maybe one day he'll let you look into the book. Well, right now the book's all wide open. Go, you know, for very little outlay, you can dive straight in and actually bring your unique take on whatever the subject it is, whether it's 3D printing, electronics, sewing, cooking, you name it. Anything that's creative and that allows you to express and what I'm doing right now is bringing those tool chains into the classrooms so, and allowing teachers to be able to do well, that. Well, let's pick this bit here as a teacher now, right? So you're a teacher among mm-hmm. many other things, and uh, you educate people about technology and the possibilities that technologies bring in their lives. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Like, for example, um, I'm interested to know what kind of innovative ways you use technology to to do your own teaching in your classroom, or if you do it online, like how do you do that? H- how do you harness technology to be a better teacher? Like some of those aspects, if you could take a few minutes to tell us about. Sure. Well, <laughs> in a lot of ways, it's exactly what we've been talking about, but just in a different context. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I use technology to engage. Mm-hmm. So instead of formally standing in front of a classroom and talking, I will talk with different technology things. So one like one example, I, I brought the Dalek into a classroom once and of course blew all the students' minds <laughs> and of course got him to actually teach what the, the lesson was and kind of became his assistant. And that, that was actually with a class that was really, really difficult. They were very unfocused. Sorry, Gil, I, I didn't get that. Who did you bring into the classroom? Oh, so I brought my Dalek in. So I, Orange that? Blend, the Dalek that I built for the film project. Ah, yes, okay. So that was the big robot <laughs> the that, robot. I, that <laughs> I built for the film project. Yeah, so I brought this full size. You know, do- people seem to like Doctor Who, so we brought him in, and he became the teacher for the for the lesson. And of course, like after that, they were very attentive because if they behaved well, uh. Orange Blend—that's the name of my Dalek—would come come in, and and they got to interact with him. When I teach, the real key to being successful is being able to create an environment where that kind of make a spark, that feeling you get when you're able to actually succeed in creating something that maybe you thought you weren't able to comes about. And I think that's something that you can tell. I can, I can actually do the whole, you know, as a, as a teacher, I can put, take them through the whole project and then give them the answer. But when they are actually in a position to be able to explore and create it themselves, then in that moment, you are able to actually share that experience with with other people and that is the engagement model that I use. So I use technology in, and I try to do that very early in the class so that uh, you know it's a little bit like give them a taste and then let them mm-hmm. explore their own. I also love uh, you know using technology to kind of shape up presentations. So you know I have a, an iPad that I I uh, present out off and I will do yeah. being a film guy I will always try to put something in there to, to grab people's attention. Right. Is Dalek like a regular in your classes? Should people expect it when you no. when they attend your classes? <laughs> no, so not at like all. A, a surprise. Um, quite the opposite. So uh, he actually comes out for a walk with me every once a year. Um, I try to take him down to Seven Eleven, and we leave like say nine in the morning, and we get home at like you know eight at night, and it's a fifteen minute walk, and it's just lots of people jumping out and wanting photos and to talk uh, and interact. I can see some of those photos on your websites. Um, yep, yeah, it's very impressive. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it, 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 yeah, you know, he's more popular on Facebook than I am. So that's a kind of a beautiful thing. Okay. Um, I also like to ask you about your workshops now. So you run workshops. What makes a successful workshop, especially to teachers? Like if you want to teach a teacher something new, what should you take into account as a presenter that is? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I think integrity and the idea that uh, what you're teaching is something that you love. When I was working for the city of Melbourne, I used to to do the 3D printing classes. And one of the classes was a kind of like a history or the why you would even want to use a 3D printer. And they were the sessions that I loved the most because it was the most formal class that I would give as opposed to people being on computers and actually doing the process. But what I learned really quickly is if you could relate the class to what people were interested in mm-hmm. 
and you could share with them something on a personal level as to an experience that they may experience, it brought them to a new level of engagement. Mm. And being that these classes were public, I would be flying by the seat of my pants when it would when the sessions would start because I didn't know who would actually turn up. So a lot of my class was about understanding, you know, I'd ask them all to say their name and one thing they knew about 3D printing, which would give me an idea of oh. what was going on. So find something in, in common in the then classroom. with your audience, right? Absolutely. And then, you know, I had certain things that I could go to which would relate. So, relatability, you know, kind of ties mm -hmm. into integrity, the way I want mm -hmm. to define this word. You know, always teach something that you love. And I know that a lot of teachers don't have that option. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I have a lot of people who say to me, uh, you know, I might be at work or doing a presentation. They go, you're great. And I'm like, really? I've, I've had a headache all day or, you know, I, I just got off a flight at 4 a.m. And they go, gosh, we want to see you excited. Because, like, you know, it's kind of a, yes, an amazing like thing. I had a work colleague once you know, who said to me, you know, how do you how do you relax at night? And they go, well, if that relaxes you, I'm definitely going to do that because, you know, that, uh, you know, meditate or whatever. But, um, yep. yeah. So, I guess you keep your workshops practical as well, like your classes. Have you ever brought Dalek to a workshop? Or well, I mean, the Dalek was a one-off and it yeah. was probably an extreme thing, but I love bringing examples in, p things that people can actually hold mm -hmm. upon, things that are engaging. So, I, I, again, I remember as a student, like, I wish I was at school now as opposed to when I was there because, you know, when you're looking at something that's, you know, 40 years old as the example, it has no – it has no – you can't relate to it. The yeah, students absolutely. can't relate or the teachers can't relate. Again, one of the things that I love about STEAM or maker culture, I use those two terms in interchangeably, is that, uh, you know, it's as exciting for the teacher as it is the student mm -hmm. when they're doing it for the very yeah. first time. So, yeah. you know, if you know that it can be done and it's a pretty amazing experience, that naturally gets communicated when you're in the classroom. And students through. are really good at knowing yeah, exactly how much they need to deliver in the classroom. Yeah. So, you know, you know, uh, Mr. Smith wants this much. So, I'll write the essay up to this point. But, you know, Miss Beasley only wants, you know, if I can go and mm -hmm. answer the questions in the classroom and she was going to tick me off on that. So, being able to break free and, and, and get rid of that framework also allows the students to take what their engagement to whatever level they want. Yeah. And I find that works really, really well. In, and again, part of that is just about giving permission. You know, it can go both ways. I had I had students who were making water wheels in a classroom and one student decided that he'd pick up the bucket and throw the water in the classroom. And, you know, I asked him afterwards why and he said the students were mean to me and I got my, my own back. And I went, well, that has nothing to do with the class. Yeah. So, you've got to be prepared to be able to do that and in that moment be able to kind of shift and pivot and be very agile yeah. on that. Because you still need to have some boundaries, right? Um, like that, that's oh, absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Um, another thing, um, it seems like you are always onto something, right? You, you don't really have that many idle moments, uh, except on the Sabbath, uh, <laughs> I think. Right. So, yes, what yes. are you tinkering with Thank now? Thank goodness. <laughs> Should they off? So, right now, um, yeah. you know, no, it's okay. Uh, yeah, no, Saturday, thank goodness, Friday nights and Saturdays are, are yeah. kind of like, time free days. And as much as they're, they're, I'm not in the workshop, my mind is going. Oh, yeah, can't stop that. Because I've got space, that's when I get creative, mm. which is really interesting. But uh, just before we we came to talk now, I was actually speaking to a friend of mine who was bringing me up to speed about DNA sequences. Yeah. And um, these are handheld devices that basically allow you to break down the, the DNA um, sequence of, of whatever the, the sample is. And we were talking about being able, because they're handheld and you can bring them into classrooms, being able to incorporate them into, into a situation wow. where, you know, in past 10 years, you know, you had to have a PhD and understand what was going on. So, um, I'd love to be able to get a hand, handle well, on that. Uh, what did you learn about those? Because that's quite intriguing. This is like awesome technology handheld now. It, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you give it a sample, say like a bit of saliva and it will analyze it. And what kind of results do you get back? Well, that's the really interesting part about it. And that, that's what we were ex mm. exploring, which was um, how do you take the data and take it to the next um, mm. next level? So, we were talking about drug screens, which, of course, when I heard the word drug screen, went, oh, cool. Every every office will screen their, their uh, employees for, for use of illegal substances. Yeah. And they said, no, no, that's not the case. A drug screen in a pharmaceutical um, 
area is actually trying to find a medication or a drug that will actually combat a disease. And you can use this technology to be able to get the data to process it to see which medication kind of works or which substance works. Oh, right. And again, I was, I was looking at the actual application because if it's really like these, the sequences are really easy to, to use, which means that no, you know, students can use these, businesses can. So it's again taking technology from a really highly specialized environment and putting it into the hands of almost the everyman hmm. to be able to then go and, and you take that data and be able to process it. And I find that extremely exciting because it's just yeah. a, it's another thread to the bow of, of being able to to create and make. I can definitely see such devices becoming part of the general practitioner's kit. So you go to the doctor now and they'll take out the stethoscope and check your breathing and your heart. Yep. In in a few years from now, they'll take out the DNA sequencer and spit here, please. Then a few mm-hmm. seconds later, we've got a you know, full wealth of information that is pretty much telling you everything about your health right now and what kind of medication you can take and all that. So is that something that you see happening based on your experience with the device so far? Uh, look, you know, we were talking about it. I haven't been able to uh, to work with the device. I believe it, it takes a full day for the sequencer to actually go through uh, and actually break seconds. down that information. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah, and, and I believe <laughs> okay. there's a car- the cost of the cartridge is about $500. So, mm. again, it's a little bit out there, but, you know, it'll, we'll get to the point where it's yeah. like Star Trek. We'll have a tricorder where we'll point it and <laughs> absolutely. I remember digital cameras back in the 90s, right? Um, they used to cost sure. about that much for really bad photos. Well, the analogy that I used for him was like 3D printing is a great example mm. of that. You know, the first couple of printers were, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. I believe these sequences are just a thousand dollars for the actual unit itself yes, now. Exactly. But, uh, you know, when we actually get the power of where 3D printing and the manufacturing costs and the design costs came, when people were able to actually have this equipment and be able to see different ways of being able to do it, I see the same thing happening with these DNA sequences. Yeah. So, you know, this person I was speaking to was very interested in being able to get an educational program together to be able to kind of empower people on how to actually use them in the correct way and then be able to process the data and the back end so that uh, it's not just a process that you're experiencing, but something that you can actually use as a tool. Yeah. Well, I think this technology now is in the radar, right? It is out there, which means that before we know it, it's going to be within reach of a lot of people. The costs are dropping. So awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got just one question in regards to technology. And now I just use your experience and look into the future, say five or 10 years. It's nice, not not too soon like compared to our time frame, but not too far. So we're not talking Star Trek here. Okay. So what, what kind of development in particular, let's say, let's try and focus in the context of, uh, to the context of uh, education. What kind of technology or development do you see coming that will influence how we teach and learn in the next five to ten years i think the uh the key breakthrough or you know it's already kind of here but it's going to really shape not just education but the way we communicate is Mm -hmm. uh virtual and augmented reality i can see that being Uh a a real tool in the classroom we really use that sort of stuff with like uh, google expedition being able to take students out Mm -hmm. of the classroom and give them an experience of a subject that's being taught as we develop this technology, I mean, a couple of years ago, they were saying by Christmas, you know, you'll be able to go and get a $400 headset. Um, mm-hmm. You're still waiting. Maybe it'll be this Christmas. Who knows? But uh, as the technology actually comes about, I can see this becoming kind of, you know, the conduit to being able to open up the classroom in ways that we probably don't even know now. Yeah. You know, the idea of having a global classroom where students from all around the world can come mm-hmm. together, mm-hmm. even though they're they're physically in different locations around the around the planet, and yeah. and why just limit it to, to the planet? Why not have expeditions to yeah. you know into space that way? The Big Bang, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you know, um, into the microcosm. Like imagine having a look at what an atom looks like instead of drawing it like a little planet system. Actually, you go in there and you see the fuzziness of the subatomic level <laughs> right the microverse you know literally um going into that mm-hmm. there's a lot of simulations out there right now that take you into the human body so it's very um fantastic voyagey in that sense where you know you can see the cells and and you know the different uh 
things that are that are going on if there's an infection and that's kind of that's interesting but if that's what's being delivered now it's pretty amazing to see what's going to happen yeah. in the next 5 years i i was actually introduced to a an app that allowed uh, multiple people to go into a classroom and and uh, be able to mm. uh, to be in a, yeah in a virtual classroom uh, which is pretty amazing. Mm. So it's there. I think this will be the new way we communicate. And I think uh, a lot of the, our formal ways of, of, you know, kind of like media and uh, instead of us sitting on with headsets on two different computers, we'll be in a virtual space. Actually, you'll see my body language yeah. and, and all the rest of it, which is a huge part of communication that's being lost. And I can, you know, give Peter a high five when we make a great point and, we'll, and you we'll know, back. and exactly yeah. it. In in terms of augmented reality, I also know that it's now standard part of a lot of smartphones that, um, you know, not the top of the line smartphones, so probably middle of the line smartphones come with augmented reality capabilities. And I, I wonder, like, it's probably a matter of time before educators start coming up with applications for those, for these technologies that are already in our pocket. I mean, so, uh, Pokemon Go yeah. was a great example of that. Yeah, I mean, with that now. you know, Pokemon yeah. Go, when yeah. I remember when that hit, I uh, was again at Library of the Dark, we actually happened to be what they call a gymnasium. So you could fight. So people would come down to the library to, to fight. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I'd walk around the Docklands to go get lunch and everyone was on their phone. You know, some people had two or three phones for, for people who were still upset. And I was just yeah. like, wow, well, you know, what's going on here? Um, and then when you realize, you know, people would be like, there's a Pikachu over there and we'd go and we'd collect it. The hype of the of the game has definitely died down, but it's still something that a lot of people play. And I think that was a great introduction to this idea of augmented reality. You know, mm, again, yeah. you know. I, I could never get into that to tell you the truth, but no, I can see enough. the potential. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting because as technology <laughs> comes along, you know, we've got to create language that explains it and that's something that i think yeah. you know again we, we you know it's developing the idea of augmented reality has been around for a long time it just never had that label so yeah great awesome let's get into some rapid fire questions sure uh, learn a few uh practical things that you do in your daily life so let's start with applications what application or applications can't you live without uh, taking into account like, all your creative work all your learning that you do all your communications it's got to be supported by something so i guess that's applications sure youtube on my iphone that's it that's probably my number one app that I use. Whether, you know, if I'm driving, I'll put something on and just put the uh, the phone away and then listen to mm -hmm. something. So I'm constantly kind of, I, I mentioned before, I'm a sponge. So I'm constantly kind of consuming and then and then adding that to, to kind of the lexicon of what, what's in my head and then usually spinning things on, on mm -hmm. its um, I also have a YouTube channel, so I'm also yeah. kind of a creator in yeah. that sense. And I find that that's a great way mm. of being able to uh, communicate just to let people know that if you're interested in makers and, you know, people, what people are doing around the world, I run a thing called Makers Monday where I introduce a new maker every right. Monday morning at 10 o'clock. And it's a basically it's a th between three and 10 minute interview. It's a self-interview with the same five questions that basically brings people up to speed about what they're creating and why they're creating it. So mm. it's a, it's a great way of being able to get some, uh, you know, some inspiration of what's actually out there. Yeah, uh, other people like us. So that's on YouTube. On YouTube. Right? So if you look makers Monday, there's about, yeah. I think 81 episodes. We've been running it just under two years now. Oh, um, we, we're going to link you. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, but it's also YouTube is not just a consumer thing. It's, it's you know, as I was mentioning before, I've met a lot of makers around the world and went on a maker tour mm. in 2017 where I, the highlight was meeting Jimmy Darista, but met a lot of people who are on uh, YouTube and were able to create bonds and, and relationships with those people. And again, you know, it's probably the best micro kind of community that I've found. So actually a macro community, it's not a micro community. Yeah. Where, huge. you know, if you want to learn something and I want to try something and I don't understand it, YouTube becomes my teacher or YouTube becomes my outlet to, to reach out to other people. So I would definitely say YouTube. Interesting. Yeah, you're the first one that nominates YouTube. Usually okay. people go for things like Evernote and things like that. Okay. Um, Google apps. But I guess YouTube for you, like I'm, I'm very similar to you in this uh, way as well. It's where you get a lot of your learning done. It's where you make, uh, where you express yourself yeah. through the videos that you upload. You communicate with people. Um, so it, it does cover a lot of the things that you do daily. So it is an awesome 
place. You know, a lot of people don't realize, but YouTube is also the second biggest search engine on the on the internet. Yes. So, you know... You find things. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I do a lot of traveling. So, it also, at the end of the day, if I want to... Uh, you know, if I want to watch a movie, you can do that as well. Hmm. I, I find, you know, I was thinking about music now. Yeah, I was yeah. I was thinking about this answer, and I wanted to look good and give a, you know, oh, it's you know, uh, Fusion three hundred and sixty. But I actually, the app, I actually looked at my phone and said, what which app am I using the most? It was YouTube. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, probably most of us are like that, but we actually didn't think of YouTube as an application. We probably think of it as a website or something like that. Yeah, uh, but it is an application and it does cover so many needs, just like Google, the search engine itself, but probably supercharged because of the video and the ability to see people's work and the faces and communicate through the, uh, you know, the interaction in text as well, a lot of the video. So great. Thank you for that. No problems. Um, hmm. I also wanted to know how you do all your program because I know that you do programming based on the stuff that you make. Mm -hmm. So what do you use for that? Yeah, sorry, coding. Coding. I should say yeah, coding. program co coding. Um, so I don't consider myself a, a coder. I consider myself a hacker, which means grabbing someone else's code and changing it around until uh, you know I like it. Um, you know, I'm kind of a notepad kind of guy. I'm starting to mm -hmm. really enjoy things like Blockly and Scratch because I think they're yeah. incredibly powerful. Yeah. But a lot of people kind of think because it's aimed at children, it's not you know it's not something you can actually use. I'm trying to jump into. Uh, um, Python and MicroPython, um, uh, but to be to be honest with you, it's it's something that I haven't really had time to delve too much into. But you know, I started with on Basic, and you know, I'll go back to Basic if that's mm. actually uh, you know will get my my result that I need. And I've got a number of old uh, you know home computers from the eighties, and I'll get on there and start you know spaghetti Fine, coding. Oh, they still work. I love those things. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I, I regularly test my computer, my first computer, my Apple II from 1985, running Apple Soft Basic, and it works just fine. Even the the floppy disk right. works. So so my first computer was a thing called a Sword M5, which was a Japanese computer that uses tape drives, what? and yeah yeah, and uh, and I recently just found it and threw in the the Basic G or Basic Graphics cartridge, and the thing fired up, and mm. I was back to being you know an eight year old kind of playing with technology and i was like wow yeah. super cool memories <laughs> uh, the main thing about coding or hacking is that you're not really afraid of it so you'll choose the tool that you want in order to achieve the outcome that you want right whether you are coding a robot or something else on the screen you a absolutely you're not afraid of it are you you know i i i, hmm. I have so many ideas and, and you were saying like i don't have so much time on my hands because it's it, the days are packed full that I want to get to the, to the answer that, or the application to work as quickly as possible. And if that means, you know, using mm. a jigsaw as opposed to an X-carve or a laser cutter as opposed to, you know, a file, I'll go to whatever can actually shorten that, that workflow as quickly as possible. And that's the yeah. same with, with coding. So I will use a lot. Uh, mm, I've been playing. That's good advice. Yeah, I've been playing with the BBC Micro bit, which I really like. And you know, <laughs> yes. again, it's it's you can use uh, Python on it. But I've been actually using the Java editor on Microsoft Java editor, and I'm like, you know, I'm putting these applications and downloading them onto multiple micro bits and using the radio function in it to get them to talk. And I'm like, mm, mm. why do I need to use, learn, you know, Python if I can do it? Uh, with, Python. Yeah, with yeah. Uh, with the tools that are available to me. Yeah, uh, the microbit is really well implemented in both the Python version and the JavaScript. So there's no, uh, as far as I know, at least there's no really good reason to choose one over the other, whichever one you're more comfortable with. Right. They, they've done a really good job. I just don't like syntax. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, too, it's okay. You can express yourself in different languages. Like that's another amazing thing about today and uh, today's maker technology. It's like so many different ways to say it. And Absolutely. It. Very true. Very true. All right. Uh, I've got one last question for you, and that is, uh, got any parting thoughts for our listeners? Any do's, don'ts? And just consider that many of our listeners are teachers mm -hmm. in STEM. Uh, so maybe something in relation to that, some advice perhaps. Don't be afraid to fail. Go with the thing mm. that, that, that excites you, because if it excites you, it'll excite other people too. You know, yeah. I, I, and I think that, you know, the bottom line, if you're a teacher and you're teaching – you know, STEM, give your students the permission to be able to explore. And if exploration means failing, mm -hmm. you know, I know that there's outlines and, you know, 
as a teacher, they give you the rubric and all that sort of stuff. Sometimes you've got to think outside the box. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I, I know the teachers that influenced me and the people who really inspired me to go and do the maker stuff and the, and the STEM stuff, but also to, for me to be who I am and to express myself uh, were the ones who, who understood that it yeah. didn't always conform to what was expected. So my advice to you is, you know, don't be afraid. Yes. Don't be afraid to fail because I think as teachers, our prime responsibility, a prime directive to take a Star Trek term is to help our students learn, right? It's got nothing to do with success or failure, at least in tests. So did you learn anything from this experience, which can be classified as failure because the thing didn't work in the end? So maybe that's the most important question to ask. I've met a lot of students who are academically brilliant but when you put them on the street, they fall over. And I've met a lot of people who are like street smart, but academically, you know, they wouldn't pass an exam. Both have value, both have places. And a bit of yeah. both makes you yeah. extremely powerful. Um, there's uh, someone that was a teacher of mine, a filmmaker called Robert Rodriguez, who once said that if you are creative, but not technical, you need to, you need to rely on other people. But if you're creative and technical, mm. no one can stop you. Hmm. No one can say no. <laughs> Best of both worlds. Absolutely. Also. Well, Gil, um, do you like people getting in touch with you? Well, actually, I'll take it back. Obviously, you do. <laughs> 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 What's the best way for people to get to get in touch with you? You've got multiple channels I can see on your website. Which one is your favorite? So, uh, you know, probably the best way is uh, Instagram or Twitter. Uh, Instagram is usually visuals. The mm-hmm. don't, don't tell me, show me thing is Instagram. So, I try to put up as many mm-hmm. photos of what I'm working on. Both of them are Kosher Tony Stark. So one word. Um, mm-hmm. So at Kosher Tony Stark. Twitter is a great way to do it. You can catch me on Facebook at either Gil Poznanski, which is my personal Facebook page, or Kosher Tony Stark page. And mm-hmm. YouTube as well. YouTube happens to be under my name, Gil Poznanski, but feel free to, to reach out. All I ask is if I'm in the bathroom, and this happened to me, I was in the bathroom and someone walked up behind me and said, hey, Gil, I see you on YouTube. Uh, you know, hey, can we have a chat? And I literally had to say to him, can you give me two minutes? Can, we, can I meet you outside? So uh, by all means, if, you, if uh, you know, whether it's online or not, I'm more than happy to have a chat. Always, always nice to meet people who are inspired. Or the other part about it is if you're in New South Wales and a teacher, I'm now working within the STEM share program. So you will see, catch me on T4L TV or technology for learning TV. And um, again, if you want to search for that, you'll be able to, if you're a teacher, not even in uh, New South Wales and you want to get some STEM orientated uh, material or, you know, different uh, items and, and, and machinery and, and ideas, mm-hmm. uh, T4L TV is definitely worth taking a look at. Awesome. We're going to have all that on the show notes for this episode on the on the here yeah, Tech Explorations website, on, but specifically on the Stemiverse pages. So, thank you very much, Gil, for your conversation, for your, the time. It's been <laughs> amazing. I learned so much. Um, really appreciate your time and all the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Peter. And, and really, I really appreciate you allowing me to, to come and have this chat and share it with everyone because I think it's, that's, again, it's all about communication. So, it's, this is, we're just homing another way of doing it. My pleasure. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Gil are available on our website, techexplorations.com forward slash p forward slash stemiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a goldmine of information in the notes. This Stemiverse podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at pa at txplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, STEMiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.